Amen. All right, keep your place there in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. So what we're going to talk about this evening is how to get right with God. How to get right with God. Now 1 John chapter 1 is kind of an interesting chapter for me because when I was a Lutheran before I was even saved, you know, this, these verses were, some, were part of, of many of the services that we would chant over and over and over again. And we'll get into some of those specific verses here in a little bit. But, you know, they, I want to teach you the true meaning of those verses. But this, this evening, I really want to just look at, you know, getting right with God and what does that process look like in your life if you want to get right with God. You know, getting the, getting the sin out of your life, we talk a lot about that in this church. But, you know, getting right with God, you know, what does that actually mean? What does it look like? And how, how is that actually done in your life? So as an introduction, you know, you'll meet some people out there, you know, this idea that we're all sinners is pretty much universally known amongst people. You won't find a lot of people who you go out soul winning and you try to tell them that, hey, you know, there's none righteous. No, not one. And they're like, oh, but I'm righteous. But, you know, there are these people out there. There are people that believe in sinless perfection. But 1 John chapter 1 is a great chapter for us here. If we look down at verse number 8, the Bible says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if you have somebody that you're you know, talking to about the gospel, and you're, you're at, you get to that first part in Romans chapter 3, and they say, I, I stopped sinning. You know, I got... I got saved, or whatever they want to call it, and I, I no longer sin. You will meet, these people are out there, okay? You can guarantee that that person, the Bible says that that person is a liar. They're not telling the truth. The truth is not in them. In verse number 10, again, the Bible says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So obviously, you know, we will never stop sinning in our lives on this earth. So look at, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's just explore this idea of sin in our life and you know, how long are we going to be sinning in our lives? How long are we going to be sinning in our lives? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's read a few verses here and see you know, what the Bible says about this condition that we're in on this earth. In 1 Corinthians 15, look down at verse number 42. Let's start reading at verse 42. For the Bible reads, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Notice those two words there that are going to keep coming up in the, these verses. It's corruption and incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So we see that there's this contrast between corruption and incorruption and dishonor and power, and a natural body, and a spiritual body. And it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is, as is the earthy, such are they that are earthy, and it is heavenly, they, there, they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. This is, you know, us being conformed to Christ, right? And as if we, and now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So verse number 50 is kind of depressing if you take it by itself. Right? Because I don't know about you, but I'm flesh and blood. Right? And it says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know, this is basically, you know, along the same lines of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. A lot of false doctrine comes from these, these verses in the Bible where it says, you know, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he goes in and he lists a bunch of sins, fornicators and, you know, extortioners and things like that. And you're just like, man, you know, do we have a chance at getting to heaven. But then in, in, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And you're like, wow, what's going on here? But then verse number 51 explains it. It's because we will be changed. We will be changed. And when will we be changed? In a moment, we will be changed. 
In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the Bible is telling me that my incorruptible flesh and blood is going to be raised in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and it's going to be made incorruptible. So, you know, there we go. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This, you know, so when will you stop sinning, basically, is what I'm getting at here. You know, as long as you're alive in your flesh and blood, never, unfortunately. Okay? You will be changed in the moment at the rapture, at the first resurrection. Okay? So everyone here, you know, the good news is, the Bible says that blessed is those who are part of that first resurrection. You know, we will rule and reign with Christ. The good news is that if you're sitting here listening to my voice right now, you will be part of that first resurrection. Amen. All right, we preached on this several weeks ago. So you say, turn to Romans chapter, Romans chapter 7. Let's, let's look at this idea of the flesh a little bit more. Look at this idea of the flesh a little bit more. Romans chapter 7. And I know we preached through Romans chapter 7 um, a couple months ago, but let's just take a look at it, this idea of the flesh, a little bit more. Look at Romans 7 and verse number 14. And Paul says this, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more that that no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's talking about this war that he's wrestling with here, that he doesn't want to do what he, you know, he hates these things, but he does them anyway. And then verse 17, or verse 18, he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's talking about the war between his spiritual self being saved and the flesh that he has. So you will have this flesh as long as you are alive on this planet. So you say, you know, how can I be right with God? How can I be right with God if I still sin? That's the question, right? Well, think about, turn to 1 Samuel 15. Think about, as an analogy here, think about your children. Think about your children, for those of you that do have children. You know, as, as your children are younger, when they're young, they just need to be spanked constantly. I mean, it's just constant spankings with these young kids. They're constantly doing things wrong. But when they get older, when they get to be 10, 11, 12, 13, while they still do things wrong, they should have their heart towards their parents. They should respect the rules and guidelines that their parents put in front of them. Otherwise, they're in what we would call disobedience. Now, in 1 Samuel 15, I just want to focus on verse number 23, but we basically see the story of King Saul, and he has disobeyed God's orders. And Samuel came to him and said, you know, you've disobeyed God's orders. And what does he do? He makes all sorts of excuses. He blames other people. He says, I did follow. You know, he says he followed God's law. He just, he's throwing all these things out there to divert the blame away from himself when what he really did was just disobey God. And he would not admit it. And in verse number 23, Samuel says this. The Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Samuel tells Saul that he is in rebellion against God. And then he says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast, and now this is some pretty harsh words, but I want you to remember these three words, rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. So Samuel tells Saul that not only was he in rebellion, but he had rejected the word of the Lord. Now that's serious. Turn to Luke chapter 12. So the state of your heart is important. Saul's heart was not right. It was not right towards God. Turn to Luke chapter 12 and look at verse number 47. <coughs> Verse number 47. 
In Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47, the Bible reads, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall, much be, much be, shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So this is comparing this idea, and we're really going to dig into this idea in this sermon of if you know the Lord's will and you openly disobey it, you are going to be beaten with many stripes, the Bible says. Now look, these two guys in verse number 47 and verse number 48, it, it, it appears that they did the same thing. They did the, you know, it, it's, it's comparing that they did the same sin. They went against the same will, but one of them knew it was wrong and one of them did it. And, it mean, and the one that knew it was wrong and did it anyway is going to be severely punished, the Bible says. So look, this is the guy... This is the guy that's like, you know, I'm saved and I'm just going to do what I want. You know, that's why you know when you run across these people out soul winning and you, you run across these people and they, you tell them that, you know, salvation is free and it's a gift and you can't earn it and you can't lose it. They're like, you can't, you can't tell people that. Catholics will say this sometimes. You can't do, people will just go crazy. People will just go nuts. It's free and you can't lose it. You go crazy. But look, my, my goal of the sermon this evening is this, is to convince you that you do not want to be this guy. You do not want to be this guy. And if you walk away from the sermon tonight thinking, you know, I don't want to be this guy, I'm just going to go party and drink because I'm going to go to heaven. You are going to go to heaven if you're saved. If you're saved and you go party and you go drink and you do whatever you want to do, you're going to go to heaven. But I'm going to convince you that it's not worth it. I'm just going to live in fornication with my girlfriend or whatever. You know, you don't want to be that guy. And I'm going to show you why. Because you're in disobedience, the Bible says. You're in rebellion, as the Bible says. And rebellion is as witchcraft. Witchcraft was punished by death in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So when Samuel said that rebellion is as witchcraft, that's some, that was some serious statements. All right? Look, here's the thing about a church like this. If you're not going to get right in your life, if you, you're in sin and you're not going to get right, you would literally be better off not coming here. If you were saved and you're living in sin and you, you're just, I'm not going to get right you'd be better off not coming here. Because the Bible says that when you sit here and you hear that what you're doing is wrong and what you're doing is against what the Bible says and that you're in disobedience and you're in, rebel you're in rebellion to God, that you're going to be beaten severely. And that will happen to you. It's like, I mean, it's right there in the Bible. It's a promise. I mean, look, you'd be better off not knowing. That's why these people that go to, you know, happy, clappy rock concert church or ceiling fan church or whatever it is, that's why they look and they act just like everybody else in the world. They don't want to come here. I mean, most of them aren't saved, but if they are saved, they don't want to sit here because they don't want to know. And they don't want to hear it. Because if they do hear it, they're going to be beaten with many stripes. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So it's about the state of your heart. Getting back to my, my point. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you don't have to reach sinless perfection to be right with God. You just need to have the right heart towards God. So step one of getting right with God is getting your heart right. Is getting your heart right. Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Psalm 51 is after David's great sin of murder 
and adultery. So David had, he had killed Uriah the Hittite after he had committed adultery with Uriah's wife. Then he had Uriah murdered. Then, you know, David is, is confronted by Nathan. And the difference between David and Saul is David immediately says, I have sinned against the Lord. Right away. Right away. Then David, he, he didn't escape punishment. His son dies. You know, David, you know, he gets in sackcloth and ashes and he begs for the life of his son. God said no. And his son dies. And Psalm 51 is David getting his heart right after this happens. And look at Psalm 51 and verse number 1, where the Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So you need to get your heart right. You need to ask God for mercy in your life if you've been in disobedience. Now look, you could say, you know, you could say that this idea of falling into sin and having a disobedient heart is a chicken and egg scenario. Which one came first? But I present to you tonight that according to the Bible and according to most things that I've seen in my life, it, the heart leaves first and then sin sets in. It's typically how it goes. So in turn, the heart must come back first. The heart must come back first. Now look, this is so true because people who are backslidden, you can see it in their heart. You can see it. They, may not, may, they maybe can't see it all the time, but you can see it in their heart. Turn to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. You're there in the book of Psalm. Just, keep, just go back to Psalm 16. You must have a heart that turns again towards God, and then you can ask forgiveness and mercy from the Lord. Psalm 16. This is, this is kind of an interesting um, theme that pops up in, in the Bible. But in Psalm 16, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. Then go to Psalm 17, verse number 3. Notice how it says, in the night seasons. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. It, you know, his, his conscience instructs him in the night seasons. Look at Psalm 17 and verse number 3. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and, I sh and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So we see here that there's this idea that, you know, you're... And, and isn't this true? When you're sitting quietly alone at night that you will, you will think about you know, your, your life and maybe your state with God and your relationship with the Lord will become clearer when you're out of everything else and at night. I actually believe that this is maybe one of the reasons that the devil pushes so many night activities. Right. That the devil pushes so many, you know, the nightclubs. And we look at what's going on over here some nights and all this, just this drunkenness and chaos. Because God... You know, Satan doesn't want you alone with the Lord at night with your conscience. He would rather have you not sober and in, in the world and in sin so you're not, you don't have that moment of clarity in your life. Because first, in order to get right, first, your heart has to get right. That's the first step. What's step number two? Step number two. Go back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and look down at verse number 3. And the Bible says this, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in, my sin, in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I love verse 4 where he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. David never blamed God for the judgment that came upon him. He took it like a man, and he knew he deserved it. 
So whatever judgment comes upon you, first of all, this isn't really my point, but whatever judgment comes upon you after you have gotten your heart right or during getting your heart right, before you, you know, are getting, you're in the process of getting right with God, just understand that God's right whatever he does to you. I mean, David lost his son. And he didn't come out blaming God. He just said, you know what? You're, 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 you're the perfect judge, is, is what you are. And then he just says, purge me. Get me right. I want to be clean. Wash me. Confess your sins to God. Go to Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 6. That's what he does. I acknowledge my transgressions, he said. <clears throat> Look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 6. People are getting baptized in Matthew 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says, And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Go back to John 1.1. 1, 1. Go back to John 1.1. 1, 1. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, I'm sorry. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, verse number 9, where the Bible says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have repeated that verse thousands of times in a church that believed that that was tied to your salvation. This is talking about getting right with the Lord. Confessing your sins. The people that were baptized in the Jordan, they were already saved. And they were confessing their sins. Confessing your sins is the second part of, you know, it's, it's part of getting your heart right, but it comes after your heart is right. And if you look at verse number 7 of Psalm 51, I'll just read it again for you, it's a cleansing. It's a cleansing process. David says, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So look, it's a cleansing process that you have to go through. You know, it, it, Confessing your sins has nothing to do with being saved. You know, this confession of sins after that they were baptized, or after you come out of sin and confessing your sins to the Lord. It's about getting right. It's about having a good relationship with your Heavenly Father, is what it is. We were, you know, I was a confessional Lutheran, and they believed that you had to confess your sins constantly. And I could never get over that, because I was always thinking, what if I forget one? What if I miss one? You know, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. What if I forget to confess some foolish thought that I had? You know, what if I wasn't really sorry about one that I confessed? And it's a vain repetition, first of all. It turned 1 John 1, 9 into a vain repetition. How sad is that? Some of the most beautiful verses in the Bible are turned into vain repetitions by a heretics. So the first step to anything, and I don't know how many books have ever been written on this, but the first step to anything is admitting you have a problem. You know, I don't know how many step programs they have, and the first step is admit you have a problem. You know, confess your sins. The Bible never gets any credit, though. It's all from the Bible. Amen. Step number three, we see that there's this cleansing, this washing. Is Step number three is to walk in newness of life. You now have a clean heart, a heart that does not want to continue in your disobedience. Go back to Psalm chapter 51. Go back to Psalm chapter 51. And look at verse number 8 of Psalm chapter 51. David is going through this process that I'm explaining to you. Psalm chapter 51, look at verse number 8, where the Bible says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. This proves, verse 12, proves that 1 John 1, 9 is not about salvation. He says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He doesn't say, restore unto me my salvation. He's always, he's always been saved. He's getting right with God. And then in verse number 13, then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So step number 3 is to walk in newness of life. You, these people were getting baptized. They were confessing their sins. They were getting their hearts right with the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 
chapter 6 and verse number 3. The Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's why they were confessing their sins. They were confessing their sins so they could rise up and walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You should not serve sin. Amen. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Because you, have, you, are, you are free from it. You can overcome these problems in your life and we should then walk in obedience in newness of life. We should leave rebellion, change our hearts, confess our sins, and walk in newness of life. Amen. That's the process. So look, that's the process of getting right with God. Just a little bit of application on that tonight. I just want to really get one point across tonight. And it's this idea of going from disobedience to obedience. And that's probably going to mean, if you're kicking some sin in your life, it's probably going to mean some changes in your life. So that we can stay in disobedience. Because look, think about it this way, parents. If you have a child who is disobedient and then comes to you and asks for mercy, and then the very next day is disobedient again, and then gets right and confesses to you and gets right with you and then is disobedient again and again and again. Is your mercy meter going to go up or down with that child? Think about that. Think about that with your relationship with your Heavenly Father. As you walk through this life, are you starting to see the importance of walking consistently in the newness of life? Do you want God to have zero mercy with you? Do you want God to be so irritated with you that He has less and less and less mercy with you every single time? Not me. Not me. But this is going to take some changes. It's probably going to take some changes on places you go, on people you hang out with. I mean, family that you deal with and how you deal with them, it all probably needs to change for some of you. Or maybe all of you. Maybe you need to set some rules, some different rules for yourself and your family. Change your routines. Maybe some of you, your whole life needs to change. Who you hang around, how you speak. Maybe in some cases, where you work. You know, 1 Corinthians 5.11, we talked about all these things that if any man be called a brother and do these six sins, we'll kick him out of church. And we've done it. But verse number 10 talks about that we will be in the world with people. We will be, you know, in the world with people. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. But look, it's going to take some changes in your life because look, you do not want to be this person that is constantly falling back into disobedience because God is going to, is going to, is going to beat you down big time. And I'm going to prove it to you right here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, he, chapter 10, I'm sorry. Now, Hebrews, look, you have to remember Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, right? I mean, it's for all of us, don't get me wrong. But the context of Hebrews is explaining the gospel of the New Testament to the Jews. And to the Jews who knew the law of the Old Testament. Okay? Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And turn there myself. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to start reading in verse number 25. Now verse number 25, we talk about verse number 25 all the time. We're going to read that here because I'm going to come back to it. But really what I want to focus on is the verses after verse number 25. In verse number 25, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, "...not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching." <coughs> verse number 26, "...for if we sin willfully, 
after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a, cer a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Turn to Numbers chapter 25. Uh, Numbers chapter 15. Sorry. Numbers chapter 15. So here he says that if you sin willfully, that there remaineth no more sacrifice. For what? Does that mean you lose your salvation? What? That sounds, that sounds like you can, you know, what does that mean? He's relating to the Jews that know the Old Testament. Go to Numbers chapter 15. And I'll explain to you what he's talking about. Numbers chapter 15, look at verse number 28. I want to wait for you all to get there. Numbers chapter 15 and verse number 28. And the Bible says this, and it says, And the priest shall make atonement. He's talking about the priest sacrificing for atonement. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul. That means the, the, the person, okay? That, that sinneth ignorantly. When he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. This is talking about the act of the priest. You know, this person who has sinned ignorantly, the priest can make a sacrifice for him and he can get right with God. He can get right. He can make, get right with God. It doesn't take away sins. We know that, okay? Verse number 29. He shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously whether he be born in that land or a stranger, the same reproach, the same reproacheth the Lord, and the soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord. Sound familiar? Sounds like Saul. He rejected the word of the Lord. He despised the word of the Lord, and hath broken his commandment that his soul shall be utterly cut off, and his iniquity shall be upon him. This person, this soul, should be cut off from the people. So what? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 26 is talking about, he's relating to these Jews talking about how if you sin ignorantly, there's, there's a way for you to get right and it's a sacrifice. But he's saying there was no sacrifice for someone who just knew the law and just sinned against it. They were cut off from the people. It was a very severe punishment. They were, they were punished hard. And let's keep reading. Look at verse number 28. See, and here, here he explains it. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment supposed ye, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of, done despite unto the spirit of grace. Woe! He's saying that if you are saved and you've accepted the free grace that was paid for you by the blood of Jesus Christ, and then you go out and you sin willfully, that is like troddening the Son of God under your feet. I mean, have a nice day. I mean, some free ride. I mean, it gets even, I mean, but wait, there's more. Look at verse number 30. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So here's the thing. Here's what you say to that guy that says, You know what? I'm going to get saved and I'm going to go out and just party up my life, man. Hey, it's a fearful thing where you're going. It's a fearful thing where you're headed with your life. It's a fearful thing if you know what you're doing and what you're supposed to be doing and you're going against it and you are despising the word of the Lord. It's a fearful thing. I'm afraid for you. That's what the Bible says. Look, now this is it. I mean, this is why it's important to be in a church and to hear preaching that will tell you this and to be around believers that know this. Because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I mean, it, it should scare you because of what God can do to you. I mean, you're saved. You're not going to go to hell. But, but God can... It's a fearful thing. So you say, 
there's safety in, in coming to church and learning these things and being exhorted. And when you're backslidden, guess who can, guess who can tell that you're backslidden before you can? Other people around you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at verse 25 now. Why is verse number 25 with verses 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30? Because not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's why you need to be in a church like this, if you're saved especially. Because, look, it, it, you don't want to fall in the hands of the living God. You want to stay in obedience because there's severe punishment for you. You say, well, I, I remember saying that to my wife one time. We were getting ready to move from North Dakota to, to Sacramento. I mean, I remember saying that, that very thing to her, saying we were, we were on our walk that we always took down the, down the dirt road, and I just remember saying to her, you know, because it was so hard, the road we were heading down with, with, with changing our lives the way we were, and it was so difficult. And, and I said to her, and it was tongue-in-cheek that I said to her, but I was like, you know, I almost wish I didn't know what I know now. You know what I mean? I mean, I didn't really mean that, but I, I, we just looked at the road in front of us and all the changes that were going to be required. But see, we knew the truth. We knew the truth, and we knew what we were supposed to be doing and I knew that if I didn't do it, it's a fearful thing. And you can't unknow it. You can't unknow the truth. And that's basically what I was saying to my wife. It's like, you know, you can't unknow the truth. You can't unknow the truth. It sure was more relaxing and, you know, simpler, I guess, is a better way of putting it when we were just, you know in business and just going to work and going to a lame church and things like that. But I mean, it's, it, you know, there was much less joy in it. I'll tell you that, I mean, in the big picture. But look, it's a fearful thing. So you need to stay right. Staying right is super important because God's mercy will drop with you. God's mercy will drop with you. Go back to Psalm 51. Go back to Psalm 51. I love how Psalm 51, how, how this passage, I love how this passage with somebody who's getting right with God, I love how it ends. And I love how, how it just, he, he caps it off. Look at verse number 13. Verse number 13 of Psalm 51, where he says, Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guilt guiltiness, O God, Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Look, this is why David asked for his clean heart back, and he's just saying, you know, my tongue shall sing aloud about your righteousness. You know, you can tell even if somebody's backslidden by how they sing in church. You can tell if somebody's sitting with their hymnal like this. You know, this, this is not a person that's living a spiritual life. This is not somebody who, David said, when I get the joy of my salvation back, my tongue shall sing about you, is what he said. So think about that when you're, when you're singing the hymns, by the way. Think about that. And then in, look back at verse number 13. You know, he, he's talking about going out soul winning, is what he's talking about. David said that, you know, now that he has the joy of his salvation back, he's like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to spread the gospel, Amen. is what he said. And you know, that's what will happen if you get your heart right. Yeah, if your heart is right, if you come out, you get your heart right, you confess your sin, you lay it on the Lord and you say, you know, God have mercy on me. You take your lumps that God decides to give you and you, you walk and you start walking in newness of life. You know, you, you, will want, you will start to want to go soul winning. Amen. You will start to get uh, uh, a passion for lost souls. Amen. Right. You will start to feel that. I mean, do you, do you wonder why some people just want to get out there soul winning and some people just don't? It's a heart issue. That's all it is. It's the state of their heart. You know, people that want to just go out and just get people saved because you know what? Whether you like it or not, people are going to hell. People die every day of all kinds of things. All kinds of things. And, they, you know, 99% of them 
or whatever that high percentage is, they're going to hell. And hell's real. You know, it's not a plastic hell. <laughs> one of my friends told me one time. It's real, and it's scary. So look, get spiritual. Get fed by the Word of God. Get soul winning. David said he'd literally become a soul winner. You know, get plugged in. Read the Bible. Start hanging around the, the right set of people. You know, don't forsake the assembly, the assembling of ourselves together. Start hanging around the right set of people. And then you know what? You'll stay right. You'll stay right. And then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to use your life for an eternal meaning, you know, for eternal value for other people. You know, so that's the process for, for getting right. You know, confessing your sins is a good thing. It's one of those things that's been used so much for false doctrine that people are almost afraid to bring it up. But confessing your sins is a good thing. And it's part of getting right with God. It just doesn't, it's, it's not tied to salvation that like all these other Catholics and Lutherans will use it for. But getting right is, uh, Psalm 51 is a process of David getting his heart right. And he's going through this process of getting right with the Lord again. Getting that joy of his salvation back. And guess what? When you get right with God and you do know all the laws of God and you do, you know, start walking in that newness of life, there is a lot of joy there. So it's not like you're just going to have this lame life. You're going to have this joyful life. Look at the Macedonians this morning. Look at, the, look at the situation that they were in. I mean, they were dirt poor. They were under all this affliction, the Bible says, but they had an abundance of what? Joy. I mean, that should like pop out of the Bible at you and be like, whoa, how do I get that? You know, it's not about money. It's not about having a great life. It's just about their hearts were right, period. So, getting right with God. Super important. Stay right. Stay right with God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for church today. We thank you for all these people that would uh, you know, be faithful to the house of God, Lord. Um, we love your word. We thank you for the Bible. Lord, we ask you to put a, a hedge of protection on this church and on, on all of our, our friends and family, Lord. We, we just, uh, just keep us, um, keep us solid through interesting times, Lord. And uh, we thank you for everything you've given us. Please bless the rest of our evening, people that are traveling, and the fellowship to come, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.